Hey, 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 what's up, gearheads? Welcome back to the show, Hammerhead Gearhead. Noel Guevara here, conservation photographer and filmmaker. So today, we take a look at the tip of the spear of the Nikon Z mirrorless lens lineup. Can you see it? It's right here. It's speaking into the frame. So last episode, we took a look at the Nikkor 8-15mm fisheye, which is undoubtedly my favorite lens when it comes to underwater wide-angle photography. So that's my favorite most used lens, and I felt like I needed to honor it with a retrospective review, so check out the video right here. But today, we take a look at the opposite end of the focal length and um, release date lineup. So the 8-15 wide and release 2016-2017. And this one, which is the Nikkor 7200 2.8Z, released this year. And yes, it's a telezoom. So this encountered a lot of difficulties and challenges because of COVID. So manufacturing, delivery, distribution, but it's here now to stay and probably for good in my life. So yeah, like, subscribe and hit that notification bell and let's get started. Before anything else, I would like to express my profound gratitude for all the support that you guys have given me and this channel since we started back in January of this year. So if you recall, the very first video or review I've done is the Nikon Z7 One Year Honest Field Review for Documentary in Wildlife Photography. So I think right now it's close to 30,000 views. And I also did one somewhere in between, probably around April, I think, or May, which is the Nikon Z50 review. And that one is a going to a close second, I think. So it's, I think, 27 or 28,000 as well. So for a content creator like myself who just started this year, I have no words, really. It just makes me warm and fuzzy inside. And that feeling is awesome. So thank you again. And uh, here's to doing more reviews and more trips and uh, tackling more conservation issues. So let's get into the brass tacks of the 7200 2.8Z. My very first Nikon 7200 lens was the VR2. And at that time, again, I didn't see it as an essential focal length. So I skimped and got a secondhand unit and it was so bad, the zoom ring was so loose that I had to throw it around just to get to the focal length that I needed. But it solidified, you know, the importance of that lens in terms of my lineup. And I knew that next time I have to make the right decision and actually invest in a good 7200 lens and definitely not a second hand. But still, with the VR2, I was able to take a few photos, really good photos, and I really started to regard it as an essential part of any photographer's kit. After working with the VR for a while, I realized that yes, okay, 7200 is an essential focal length that I should have in my kit. So for my next lens, I played it smart and bought a brand new 7200 2.8 FL. And I have to say, this lens is the best 7200 in the market in the world. I am really happy with this lens. It's ultra fast. It's sharp from edge to edge. Image quality is amazing. It's light, focuses really close, and it it's tough. It's uh, very robust and it could take a beating. So that's what I need it for. And honestly, it's, it's a tough lens to beat. So let's put it here. And of course, we have the 7200 2.8Z. So in this video, we will assess the build, the features, the specs, the image quality, the handling, and we'll compare it against the FL. So I'll call this the Z, I'll call this the FL. Although, of course, this has fluoride coating as well. But for the purposes of this video, let's just call them as they are Z and FL. So let's do it. Okay, so let's start with the build. Here on my desk is the FL lens. And let's look at the numbers. It weighs 1,430 grams and is 202.5 millimeters long by 88.5. And here, if you bring it in, is the Z. So going through the reviews, the initial reviews, they've been saying that the Z um, is heavier, is longer, and it's bigger. So it loses instantly. Uh, against the FL. But again, let's look at the numbers. So the Z weighs 1,440 grams. So that is just 10 grams heavier than the FL. It is 220 millimeters long. So obviously in that regard, it is longer, right? But if you're shooting with the Z system, 
then of course you have to use an FTZ adapter with the FL. So this FTZ is 30 millimeters thick or long, and then it's 135 grams. So if you add it with the FL, that becomes heavier and also longer than the Z. So this one comes out as the winner. But that said, if you take the Z system out of the equation and you're shooting again with just a DSLR, DX, or FX, then of course, this lens comes out lighter, shorter, and smaller. So in the sense of shooting DSLR, then this of course comes out as a winner. Let's bring back the Z lens so we can talk about the color and the tripod feet. So same with both lenses is that the color is permanent and fixed. You can't remove it. But the tripod foot can detach like so. Same with the Z lens. There you go. All right. Not much difference in terms of the feet themselves. But here, you would notice that there are raised areas where the tripod feet connect. And I've read some reviews that this is bothersome for them. It uh, makes it uncomfortable to handhold. Honestly, I've never had a problem with that. In fact, sometimes I don't even remove the, the tripod foot anymore. So, I mean, it's good to assess these things from um, a very, very technical standpoint. But in terms of practicality, applying it and using it in the field, you know, it's the least of my worries, actually. And for the Z, I like that they have this cover that reveals, when you open it, this nub for a lock. But overall, it, they're all the same in terms of the color and the foot. Where they start to differ is actually in the build, right? So when you see the lens, the FL lens, it's very solid, metal plus plastic where it's needed so they can lessen the weight, but it can go through and survive punishing conditions. I've taken it through that and peace of mind all the way. But with the Z, you can see that it seems to be more of plastic than metal. How it's going to hold up in the same conditions that I brought this lens through is a cause for concern for me. So, but we'll never know until we've tried it out. I will take it out in the field later, as you will see in this video. But honestly, you can only really say how well it holds up after months of use. So we won't know that till then, but we'll work with what we have. So we'll take it out and see how it holds up. So let's zero in on the Z lens. So here near the base is a control ring. So this is new. You can set it for aperture, exposure compensation, or ISO. I love this. I use my control ring for exposure compensation since I normally shoot aperture priority. So rather than have to push the button and then rotate the dial, I can just go straight to the control ring. Then here you can see function buttons one and two that goes all the way around. So my function two button is set to subject tracking. I haven't used the first one yet, but if I was to probably have to do something with focusing, what I want to do is try to remove the uses of the function buttons on the camera body, which is somewhat hard to reach for me. These are easier to reach, more ergonomic and easier to access actually. So I would use these, these are great. The lens also moves internally, so it does not extend, and it has a 77mm sized filter thread. So that is great, it's more universal, and it's the same with the FL lens. It also has fluorite elements for sharper images for a telephoto lens, much like the FL lens before it. This lens also has an impressive close focusing distance at 0.5 meters at 70 mm and 1 meter at 200 mm. So that is a big improvement with the FL lens, which close focuses at 1.1 meters across all focal lengths. What also caught my attention is the improved vibration reduction of this lens, especially when combined with the in body image stabilization of the Z6 and Z7. So, this is rated for 5.5 stops. So, that is the biggest improvement in any Nikkor lens. Of course, in the real world, it may not be 5.5, it might be less, let's say 4 or 3, but still, that is a big improvement. It also boasts multi drive autofocus. So, that is two autofocus motors moving the AF around. So so that makes for a very stable platform, especially for video. Now that we have familiarized ourselves with the lens, its features and capabilities, let's take it out in the field for some testing. 
Okay, so it's half past six in the morning and I'm on my way to La Mesa Watershed, which is the last remaining rainforest of its size here in Metro Manila. So it's a protected area, lots of species, lots of birds, especially now because it's migratory season. So it's about an hour away, 20 kilometers away from where I live. And we are hitting it at a very slim window because it just recently opened up after being closed because of COVID. And today is the only morning that I saw that we have sunshine after weeks of low pressure areas and storms. So I hope that luck is on our side in terms of weather. Our route took us six kilometers around the lake and back. And after two hours of walking, I was really getting frustrated because we weren't seeing any birds. Mud was getting into everything and there were moments of light drizzle. But one thing I could say is that these were not a problem for the weatherproof lens and camera. Then it was only in our last kilometer on a viewing deck that I finally spotted the bird that we could photograph. This arctic warbler was inspecting a web for food perfectly situated in front of a distant background of trees. I used Dynamic Area AF for this batch of shots. It was more than enough for tracking and keeping this little bird in focus. The focusing was pretty spot on and the image quality is just delicious. When it's in focus, it's really tack sharp. All these photos are straight out of camera but here is one with some Lightroom adjustments. Sharp, vibrant, and impressive display of dynamic range. Okay, so after that long trek, we're back, and I would have to say we didn't have much subject, so it wasn't a complete success, to put it gently. I don't know if it was because it just rained, there was a storm, or we came in late, but because there's a curfew, we really couldn't leave early as well. But one thing I could say is in terms of build, the build of the 7200 is really, really good. Even if it's mostly plastic, the weather ceiling is good. Even if it rained a little and there was some mud on it, it was fine. So that's, that, that's great. And the throw from 7200 is just right. It's really short, so that's good for use. Good balance, ergonomics, and I really like the handling. The function buttons were of much use for me for subject tracking. And the vibration reduction is also good. It was very smooth, very stable. So all of that means that it's a good lens for my use, at least for wildlife photography. I just wish we had more subjects, but I want to test it some more. So let's try something out. Hey guys, top of the morning to you. It's still a bit dark here in Manila. I'm on my way to a place called Navotas and it's the day after one of the worst and biggest super typhoons to ever hit Manila. But last night I got an invite. I was very lucky enough to get an invite from the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines. They have a trip today and seeing that I needed to test the lens and I want to take photos and just basically to go with them. Really, really great group and I hope we have a lot of subjects today. So exciting stuff and Let's see how it goes. I was caught completely by surprise by our shooting environment. I thought we were shooting on this breakwater right here on the right and not in the muck down there. So we had to get down and dirty to get close and I was wearing the wrong shoes, but everyone was a trooper. So I jumped right in quite literally. I started with this flock of great egrets that were hunting near the bank. Off the bat, I knew that 200 millimeters, even on DX mode, was too short a reach for what we were shooting. But I couldn't get any closer because I was sinking, so distance really was the game. So here are a few shots of those great egrets. The function buttons and controlling were good to have, as they made subject tracking and adjusting compensation more accessible and instantaneous. 
The subject tracking seemed to be fidgety, but for the most part, the photos were in focus. I was pleasantly surprised at how freakishly quiet the focusing was. When shooting wildlife, you want to be as silent as possible, and this gives us a definite advantage. So these photos, mostly static, are in focus. They're very tack sharp, except maybe for this last one, it focused on the surface of the water at the back. I tried to get some photos of birds in flight, but the subject tracking just wasn't biting as well as I would have wanted it to. But again, when it's in focus, it's really in focus, like you see here. So I added some adjustments on Lightroom and Photoshop to this image. One more try with birds in flight and same performance. But great quality when it locks on though. I moved to a more stable spot and continued shooting the rest of the morning. But as much as there were subjects, I still wanted those close-up shots for better appreciation of this lens. In terms of subjects, Novotas was a target-rich environment. You had a lot of herons, egrets, and well, I didn't have any illusions of course. I only had a 70-200 lens. I would probably need a 400 or 600 to get those really good close-ups where you fill the frame. But I'm working with what we have of course and the whole point is to review this lens. But I was really hoping at the same time that some of these birds would get close and I would get, I would get really good shots as well. So now uh, they invited me to tag along again right after Navotas to go to Barangay Tagalog. This is in Palenzuela and they basically said that hey some of the birds here just get really close so of course <laughs> tagging along again. I'm just hoping for that really good close-up shot so that we can really assess the image quality of the lens itself. Tagalog was only 30 minutes away and is literally a walk in the park compared to Navotas. We were immediately greeted by this intermediate egret just off the road in the river. After that experience with subject tracking, I decided to use Dynamic Area AF more this time. Even with Dynamic Area AF, I was still getting some issues with focusing, but maybe it's also because of that very busy background. But when it's in focus though, the image quality is just stunning. Here, I added some adjustments on Photoshop and Lightroom. I still wanted to shoot birds in flight though, so thankfully, there is this whiskered tern that was doing acrobatic moves flying in and out right in front of me. This time, I used Auto Area AF and had much, much better results. So you can see here, focused, focused, focused again, Focused again. This one is not in focus though. So one more time. Great autofocus performance for Auto Air AF. Focused. Focused. This one's not in focus though. Again, in focus. Here it is again after Lightroom adjustments and a lot of cropping and the image quality is still good. And that's a wrap for a day with the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines. So they were very nice, they were very accommodating, very generous, helped me ID the birds that I was taking photos of. And uh, they were right, Tagalog meant closer encounters with the birds but still outside the reach of my 7200 for that frame filling close up shot. So we didn't get that. But I can safely say and confidently say that the autofocus performance of the Nikon Z7200 on my Z7 is the same as the FL with an FTZ adapter on my Z7. So I recognized it immediately when I was trying to photograph those, that acrobatic whisker turn. So the, the experience is the same. But I pegged this more on the body rather than the lens, obviously. Of course, let's admit it, nothing beats the focusing of an FL lens 
on a DSLR, especially a D500. So I have tested that out also in the field in Tubataha and I would have to say that would be the basis upon which every everything else will be measured. So yeah, I hope Nikon will improve on the autofocus for the next iteration of the Z, so the Z72 and the Z62. For our final trip, hopefully our final trip, I'm heading over to my brother's village where I know there are domestic ducks. So this is, I know, a feeble attempt at wildlife photography, but it's all we have right now. And I think it's good enough for what we want to do, which is to assess and gauge the image quality of the lens itself. So we have ducks, domestic ducks. So <laughs> let's see how it goes. After La Mesa, Navotas, and Tagalag, I was caught completely off guard by how approachable these domestic ducks were. And I was shaking because I was laughing and laughing. They were probably used to being fed so they voluntarily waddled up to me and I was the one who had to back off so that I could get them in focus. That said, with a half meter close focus distance at 70 millimeters and one meter at 200 millimeters, I didn't have to step back that much. This lens focuses very close for its class. I played around with f2.8 to get a feel of that bokeh, which looks just luscious. And then also at f8, which is another default setting for me and the separation of foreground and background is still wonderful. Look at how comfortable and cuddly that duck is. And look at that detail and the image quality. Okay, so after that field test, there are only two points that I would like to discuss in this section. So first, again, is the build. So fine, it holds up, we've established that, but that's only one day of shooting. Second is the OLED screen. I really have no use for this. It's great, but honestly, it's just ornamental. For me, if it means removing this would mean it's a lighter lens, a smaller lens, then I'm better off with that. I, yeah, it's just really cool, but that's it. But aside from those two, I really think this is a really, really good lens, comparable, if not better, to the FL. Okay, so moment of truth, FL and Z side by side. Which one should you get or should you upgrade? Well, it's very simple. There are some factors that you have to consider and also situations and how you shoot. But let me lay it out, let me qualify. So if you are rarely using your 7200 FL or other 7200 lenses, and if you haven't completely invested into the Z mirrorless system, you still use a DSLR, then by all means, stick to your FL. It's a great lens in a league of its own. It's amazing. And the improvements, honestly, between the two are just incremental. So it's better off that you stick with what you have. As for the Z lens, if you have migrated completely to the Z mirrorless system and because of the VR, stable shooting and very smooth and also because it operates really, really quietly, I would recommend you get, you get this, especially if you shoot video. So that's it. Video and Z, get the Z lens. Rarely use your 7200 and use DSLR and Z at the same time, then stick to the FL. It's as simple as that. And that is it. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did filming it. The 7200 is an astonishing lens and I'm looking to adding it into my inventory permanently. So if you are too, please use the Amazon affiliate link in the description below because it supports my show. If you want to see more of my work, check out my Instagram, Noel Guevara Photo. Cheers guys, I'll see you in the next video.